this is the, the second hearing of the Environmental Audit Committee's <coughs> inquiry on flooding cooperation across government. Uh, our first uh, panellist today, we're delighted to have you here, uh, George Monbiot, who it says on my piece of paper is uh, described as a columnist for The Guardian. You are many other things, but, uh, but uh, that's, the, that's the title. Uh, and we thank you for coming and, 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 and helping us with our evidence today. Can I start by asking, Mr Monbiot, and we'll, we'll go straight into the questions if we may. Um, in your view, how has the government's approach to land management in high flood risk areas impacted on the further risk of flooding? I see it as being confused, contradictory, um, and often directly damaging. Um, it, it, there's an interaction between the government policies and European Union policies, which perhaps we can come on to. But where government is concerned, uh, one of the most foolish interventions, in my view, has been the decision by Liz Truss, if she gets parliamentary approval, um, to authorise the unregulated dredging of drains and small water courses crossing farmers' lands. Mm -hmm. Now, it may well be that in certain specific circumstances there is an argument for dredging, very limited um, in, in scope, but in particular places. But the worst thing you can possibly do is to have an unregulated, uncontrolled dredging of water courses around a catchment um, because it's likely to enhance flood, flood peaks downstream. Um, so, 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 so that's one aspect. Um, she's also spoken about um, saving uh, one million acres of farmland from flooding. Um, now, while I can completely understand why farmers wish to have their land saved from flooding, it's a perfectly legitimate wish, there's very often a payoff between flooding agricultural land and flooding the settlements downstream. If you're not storing the water on farmland, that water is more likely to be rushing downstream, hitting the nearest urban pinch point, and severely testing the urban flood defences. So you could find yourself um, uh, uh, costing the public um, hundreds of times more than if you were to pay farmers to flood their fields. But what makes this pe peculiar and surprising is that she is simultaneously talking about paying farmers to flood their fields, and a number of other sensible management um, options um, in order to try to reduce flood peaks. So there's real confusion and contradiction here, which I believe urgently needs to be resolved. And in your view, how should that be resolved, or how could it be mm -hmm. resolved? Well, I believe we should start looking at catchments as a whole. We, we are, uh, we, we've tended to look at rivers as if they arise in the floodplains. Um, and, and to concentrate almost exclusively at what happens within those floodplains. There's an entirely legitimate critique of some very foolish uh, uh, decisions in building homes on the floodplain, but the built environment accounts for just 7% of the land area of England. Um, the 93% we have tended to neglect when looking at where floods come from. And um, the, the general principle should be, rather than sitting at the bottom of the catchment where the towns are, hiding behind a flood barrier and praying to goodness that flood barrier is going to be high enough to withstand the wall of water when it comes rushing down the catchment, is to stop that wall of water from gathering in the first place. And there are various natural flood management techniques which can attenuate that, um, that wall of water, reduce the flood peak, desynchronize the arrival of water in the river um, so that you slow it down, bring down the peak, and hopefully then give your flood defences at the bottom of the catchment a better chance of succeeding. And what would be your view on the view expressed by the Prime Minister that it's up to local groups, local authorities, to know their local areas better and for they to make those sorts of decisions rather to impose sort of one-size-fits-all strategies or policies from Whitehall? I think that's got many virtues. I think there needs to be some overriding framework of principles um, and, and, and some basic common sense applied from the top, from government. But to the greatest extent possible, um, yes, we should be allowing communities to have their say on how catchments are managed. I think there is a problem at the local level in that you've got your lead local flood authorities um, whose boundaries often cross catchments. Um, and, and so they don't necessarily have an interest um, or at least a means of influencing what's going on upstream. Perhaps we should be looking um, at the catchment almost as a political unit 
when it comes to flood management. Very interesting. Thank you. Margaret Greenwood. Um, yeah, following on from that, um, from your remarks, would you say that ultimately we should be protecting people's homes rather than, um, should that be the priority rather than farmland? Well, that's certainly what makes economic sense. Um, I, it, that's not to say there should be no protection of farmland, but when there's a straightforward choice, as in many cases there is, between storing water on the, on the floodplain where it's safe to do so, in other words, almost entirely we're talking about agricultural land, or letting that water rush down to people's homes, then it makes economic sense and humanitarian sense to be storing it. And, and one thing I'm very struck by, I was walking in Cumbria recently, uh, relatively recently, and there I noted that almost all the in-by land, the, the, the low-lying land around the rivers, was being defended by embankments. Um, and this is land, of course, it's of value to farmers, but land on which a few sheep and cattle are being kept. And, and that, those defences are unquestionably exacerbating the flood risk for settlements downstream. And the choice seemed to me to be so simple. A few sheep and cattle which could be kept in barns over the winter, for example, um, or those communities downstream. How is that a difficult choice to make? Um, I wanted to ask you about what you felt about uh, Tita Helm's comments about breaking up the Environment Agency. <clears throat> but before you answer that, just on this last point, are you saying that what we should strategically be doing is withdrawing defences from rural farmland so by implication it's flooded uh, and therefore there's less pressure? Or are you saying we should have some sort of complex compensatory system of paying farmers because we're not defending them? F farmers should definitely be compensated for storing that water on their land and I would suggest that's a lot cheaper than allowing for, um, ho houses to flood downstream but <clears throat> it's not just a question of sort of passively allowing that land to flood there are various interventions that you can bring about on that land which makes it better at holding back the water there was some modelling done um, for instance on the River Carey in Somerset which showed that if you take just 2% of the catchment um, and plant riparian woodland, woodland across the floodplain. Um, um, it, its hydraulic roughness, the degree to which it basically trips up the water and holds it back, um, would um, uh, reduce the river flow by 50%, the speed of the flow by 50%, um, hold back, increase the capacity of um, flood retention by 71%, um, and um, would um, uh, hold back the water, um, the flood peak, by 140 minutes. So in other words, so what you're saying isn't that we simply stop protecting rural land because it's channelling the water down, but you're actually saying something more than that. You're saying we'd mm. actively control catchment you know, right. in a way that actually mm. the, the engineers the storage of upstream water. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and and, and, and you can do that to a large extent, not entirely by any means, but to a large extent through the strategic use of vegetation. Now, Dieter Helms, um, as I mentioned, is saying that you know, the Environment Agency should be broken up or become solely involved with flood risk management as opposed to a, a, a broader environmental regulator. Have you got any views on that? I, I, I read Dieter's testimony and I think it's got some virtues. Um, I, I, I do think there is there's a sort of panicked response um, in both the two most recent flood events this year and two two years ago, um, where um, the Environment Agency would suddenly announce that um, all its resources were being diverted to flooding, um, leaving pollution, the protection of wildlife, a whole load of other issues um, unaddressed during that time. Um, but there's also a sense that when massive cuts are levied against an agency like that, uh, whether it's divided up or whether it's intact, it loses much of its capacity to respond to a whole range of issues. So whether this is a structural problem or whether this is a funding problem, it's hard to divide those two issues. So you wouldn't take the view that um, the alternative to sharper focus is there's a more holistic approach. So in the case of Wales, mm -hmm. the Countryside Commission mm -hmm. for Wales and the Forestry Commission has mm -hmm. been mer merged with one agency, Wales, mm -hmm. So the sort of things you're talking about, which is land use management and sustainable development, can be integrated into uh, our defences. So you don't think we should do, do virtually the opposite to what 
um, Dieter Helm is saying for those mm. reasons. Do you? Mm. I, I haven't seen a comparison of the performance of NRW versus the Environment Agency, yeah. um, but um, I, I, I do think it's necessary to have a national agency to lay down principles as long as there's local autonomy about how those principles are best applied. We, we, one thing is very clear is that you can't have a one-size-fits-all approach which is going to work for every catchment. And do you think there's a, um, a sort of conflict between protecting people and protecting the environment? And I, if, if there is, do you think it would be sensible to just give one hat to one narrowly focused organisation, mm. environment agency, so that contradiction becomes worse, not better, possibly. Well, I was dismayed to see the environment agency suggest there was a conflict after David Cameron had said the same thing. Um, I don't believe there is at all. I, I, I feel that the interventions which are great for wildlife, such as rewilding, um, such as bringing back woodland in this extremely bare nation, European average forest cover is 37%, ours is 13%, um, such as allowing rivers to meander once more, allowing hydraulic roughness in the floodplain, which mostly means floodplain forests, um, woody dams in rivers. All these are tremendously good for wildlife, but they also protect the human beings downstream. That, in my view, far from there being a conflict, the two issues are complementary. On, on the structural political issue, I, 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 I haven't got much to say on that. And can I just ask... Uh, you mentioned, I think, the example of the Carey in Somerset, where the riparian woodland would have had a, a fairly substantial effect on reducing the through flow. How typical would that be? Would that be able to be applied to, to other catchments? There's a great lack of data at the moment. One of the big problems is that hydraulic modelling has not been obliged to take into account land use and land use changes. Um, it's been very much a question of do these hard defences work better than those hard defences? And so there are some real data gaps. Um, it, it's clear that catchments perform in different ways. It depends on the steepness, mm, the rock course. type, the soil type, and the rest of it. But, but by and large, the more you are impeding that water and slowing it down at crucial sections of the catchment, the safer it will be downstream. So although the details might be different, mm. the principle will mm. hold true throughout the catchments. In Holland, they have a principle called acceptable uncertainty when dealing with rivers. Um, and when it comes um, to, to issues like Room for the River, their programme there, or the Sand Engine programme, they say, well, we don't know everything. We don't yet have the whole story. Um, we're going to do these large-scale projects, which we believe are going to be very useful. They're no regrets projects anyway, because they're not doing any great harm and they're not all that expensive. Um, but they will also function, in effect, as experiments at the same time. Um, and I think perhaps there needs to be a bit of loosening up here so that we could take the same approach. Well, we're well used to acceptable uncertainties on this committee, so mm -hmm. we feel right at home, Margaret Greenwood. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. So, uh, Dieter Helm told the committee that it's fundamentally misconceived to think of flooding as an issue where you have to choose between protecting the people and protecting the environment. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I think you've partially answered mm -hmm. that question. But... Y yes, I, I, I very strongly agree with that. Um, I, I think it's... Uh, it, 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 unless we are defending the living world on all sorts of levels, mm -hmm. we, in the long term undermine our own um, prosperity, perhaps eventually our own survival. But it's especially acute when it comes to flooding issues because project after project can demonstrate that doing what works for wildlife and what works for habitats can also work extremely well for human beings. And this idea that there is a choice to be made between protecting people and protecting wildlife, in no subject does it break down more clearly, that idea, than on the issue of flooding. Okay. Oh, sorry, final yeah. question. Uh, so you argue that when faced with heavy rainfall, we have to choose either to flood agricultural land or cities and towns. And this question is, isn't that also a false dichotomy? Mm. Well, the water has to go somewhere. We we're talking about vast amounts of water coming down the catchment. Mm. Uh, after I lived in Mid Wales for five years, I discovered that it tends not to be true that the rain falls mostly on the plain. Um, it falls mostly in the hills. And um, we, unless you can hold it back, or even if you can hold it back for some time, it's going to gather eventually down, down on the floodplains. Now, the river, in most cases, can take 1%, 2% of the water that, that's, that's covering the catchment. You, you're not going to be able to use the river 
for storage. If you're dredging the river, unless in very particular, peculiar circumstances, you're likely to make the problems downstream greater. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you have to hold that water and store it. If you're to reduce the flood peak, reduce the rate of flow, and, and slow everything down to give the barriers at the bottom of the catchment a chance to work. Um, and, and that means that water has to go somewhere. And unless you're being strategic about it, unless you're holding it back, it's going to come down and overwhelm those flood defences. And I was very struck um, just before the floods this year um, um, hit in Cumbria and Yorkshire, I happened to get emails from two of my readers, one of which said, look at what they've done to the River Eden and the embankments all along the agricultural land, this is a formula for disaster. Mm -hmm. Another said, look at what they've done to the River Foss, just upstream from York, where they're protecting the agricultural land. Mm -hmm. This too is going to be a formula for disaster. I've, I've seldom, in my 30 years as an environmental journalist, come across a um, clearer link between prediction and immediate consequences than that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, what effect do you think EU policy has had on the UK's ability to ensure its resilience against flooding? Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I think this is crucially important, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, there are a number of what I see as perverse uses of public money which reduce our resilience to flooding and increase the likelihood of, of dangerous levels of floods. One of these is <clears throat> the permanent ineligible features rule attached to the basic payment scheme. Basic payment scheme is 88% of um, the money allocated under farm subsidies, um, and it's money for owning land, in effect. Um, you don't have to produce a single ear of wheat or a single lamb chop, you just have it for owning the land. But that land has to be kept in what's called agricultural condition. In other words, it must look as if agriculture can take place there, whether or not any agriculture is actually happening. And to be an agricultural condition, it must not contain permanent ineligible features. That's what they call the stuff which I call wildlife habitats. Those features include dense scrub, woods, rivers wider than a certain very narrow band, ponds, reed beds, um, uh, um, uh, buns across, across the fields. Um, in fact, they include just about every single feature which slows the flow of water downstream. So the net effect of the public funding of agriculture, of this vast amount of money that we're pouring into it, 55 billion euros across the EU, over three billion pounds in, in Britain, is to actually remove the very features that both harbour wildlife and offer us downstream protection. Uh, th this is one of the most perverse instances of subsidy rules in any industry I've yet come across. And uh, that is actually in the EU rules rather than the British government sort of I, I, environment agency over interpreting. I, I've checked this to uh, the greatest extent possible. I've, I've had contradictory responses, but the overwhelming consensus is there's not a lot we can do about this. This is, this is European rules. There is a review of greening coming up this summer, and there might be some opportunity to challenge it. But um, at the moment, um, it, it looks as if this is pretty hard and fast. So the Rural Payments Agency says farmers have got to report any features which amount to more than 0.01 hectare, uh, which is an area between me and the wall squared, um, and, um, <coughs> and they... Um, and, and those features will be classed as being outside the agricultural envelope and therefore ineligible for funding. So farmers have this very powerful incentive to erase those features from the land. Um, and, and that, it, uh, from what I can see, it's not the Rural Payments Agency over-interpreting. It's the Rural Payments Agency quite faithfully um, um, re repeating the regulations which have arrived from, from, from Brussels. Uh -huh. um, the NFU, I'm told, has responded to your uh, analysis by saying that farmers are mo motivated to maintain and improve environmental conditions and a large area of land has been brought into positive environmental management. Um, 
are there sort of alternative EU schemes that counterbalance what you're talking about? Well, 12% of the money comes under the heading of Pillar 2, which is the supposedly greening pillar, including um, high-level stewardship, for example. And in some places, it's true that that money does have positive impacts. They're very limited in scope, and the rules insist that they should be very limited in scope. They're very small areas that you can dedicate in many places to HLS. Um, in other areas, I believe that um, higher level stewardship is actually causing more harm than good. For example, there are many places in the uplands where if um, farmers weren't being encouraged to carry on doing what they are doing, they might instead be allowing the land to revert to woodland, for example, which would be better for wildlife and would also be better for floods downstream. Um, but instead, um, higher level stewardship, by adding extra money to the money that they're being paid for keeping the land more or less bare and saying don't make it quite as bare but more or less keep it bare, is, is, is having the perverse effect of creating greater environmental damage than would otherwise happen under a different regime, either a different subsidy regime or a no-subsidy regime. Um, you have argued, you put particularly the blame as far as EU regulation is concerned on them promoting grazing, mowing, burning, draining, canalisation and dredging. But others who have also blamed EU regulation or at least British governments and environmental agencies and application of those uh, directives have argued that um, uh, the green agenda actually made uh, flooding worse. Or perhaps actually you're arguing both things, and <laughs> others are merely asking, arguing one thing. Uh, um, well, it, yeah, I mean, it depends. My question, it, it depends which, which aspect. It. Yes, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're specifically talking, aren't you, about Somerset levels and um, the, um, uh, the 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 areas um, where the where the water table was deliberately raised by conservationists. Is, 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 is that correct? Is that the main focus? Of uh, I believe so. Your interest, yes. Um, so these claims were made um, by uh, Richard North and by Christopher Booker that um, uh, the, by raising water levels um, in parts of the Somerset levels that contributed to or indeed caused the floods that took place two years ago. Um, Partly in response to those claims, um, a report was commissioned by the um, Consortium of Somerset Drainage Boards, um, which um, then um, asked the Centre uh, for Ecology and Hydrology to look into this, and they discovered that the total impact of those schemes was a 0.6% contribution to, to, uh, to floods of that magnitude, um, which they described as a very small effect. Um, so... It's an effect, but it is, it is, in effect, negligible. I'm more concerned about the impact of these um, policies, including, in some cases, the perverse effect of higher-level stewardship um, right across the watershed and the way in which they prevent the regeneration of woodland and other deep vegetation which would help to hold back floodwaters. On the issue of dredging, you said that rivers take 2% of the water... What happens there on 98%? Hmm. Well, um, it's, it's in the soil. If the soil is there and if the soil is not compacted, um, it's hopefully being held back on the floodplain. And, you know, in most places, some of the farmland does flood. Um, but uh, presumably can't... it leaves the flooded land, or does it...? Oh, well, it, it, sl it slowly leaves the flood. I mean, the whole idea is about speed. All that water is eventually going to end up in the sea. It's a very small portion will evaporate, but the great majority will end up in the sea. It's a question of the speed with which it, it, it goes down towards the sea. And, and the key aim here is to desynchronize the flood peak. So you've got um, loads of small streams draining into your river. Um, if all that water is coming down at the same time, into the river at the same time, it's going to create this wall of water which is then exceedingly dangerous for the people downstream. If you can desynchronize those flows with different interventions <clears throat> along those streams, you're much less likely to have those dangerous flood peaks hitting your towns and villages. And that means allowing those streams to respond differently, but also all of them 
um, in their different ways to hold back and slow that water. Now, the dredging of those small streams, which Liz Truss wants to deregulate, which in my view is a refined form of madness, speeds the water down into the river and is much more likely to give you your high, fast flood peaks, which is where the danger lies. And why then have people traditionally dredged rivers and even required the riparian owners to dredge rivers? Mm. The primary purpose of dredging in this country has always been drainage and navigation. Those have been the two primary purposes. Now, we've latched on to dredging as being a solution to flooding, um, and in many cases we have done so irrationally. There, there are a few very specific circumstances where it's going to make sense, but they tend to be pretty limited in scope, and dredging has a whole lot of issues which can actually make situations much, much worse for people. They destabil it destabilises banks, especially when you're removing the trees growing along the banks, which you often have to do when you're creating your revetments for your dredging. Um, and that can mean that the soil then collapses into the river, causing much more silt in the river than there was before. Um, the river then try tries to find its level and it cuts back, it cuts forward, it undermines bridges, undermines weirs, can create a lot of problems downstream. Far more sensible is to stop the silt reaching the rivers in the first place. Now, silt is simply what we call soil when it's in the water. And when it's soil and on the land, it's a good thing. When it's silt and in the river, it's a bad thing. So let's keep that soil on the land. And in, for instance, the Somerset Levels, the, one of the key interventions has to stop this great flow of soil down the, down the hills into the rivers, which I witnessed myself when I went there. At the height of the floods two years ago, I could see the, the soil being washed down these, these vertically ploughed maize fields straight into this great lake which had been creative, created out of, the, out of the Somerset levels. And then at the same time, um, the, there were great calls for the dredging of that silt. Now, in some places, maybe in the Somerset levels, that had become necessary. But to do that without preventing the soil, flow of soil down the hills is like trying to bail out the bath when the tap's still running. One final question about this percent. I've found in my life that 50% of the occasions that people use percent, I can't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, and you said 2% goes down the rivers, but actually 100% eventually goes down the rivers. So what's the 2% off? Uh, so, so at any one time, a river, I know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying it is precisely 2% in all no. cases, but at any no, one time, no. a river is going to be carrying a very small amount of the water that's hitting the whole catchment. Um, and that capacity, you might be able to increase it a tiny bit by dredging. It might be 2%, and maybe you could raise it to 3%, but you're not going to make um, a major contribution to flood storage by those means. The major contribution to flood storage is going to be on the flood plain. And we must do everything we can through hydraulic roughness, through buns, through various issues like that, um, to hold it back where we can safely do so, reconnecting the river to the floodplain so that that water is then released slowly at its rate of 2% of all the water in the catchment or whatever it might be, slowly by little increments down the river rather than in a great rush. Thank you. About the um, environmental stewardship schemes, both entry and higher level schemes, mm. um, the objectives of these schemes include specifically flood management. Mm. Um, one of the, the things for which farmers can get points at entry level area is trees. Woodland is encouraged. Um, are you saying that natural England, when they are, um, you know, going round with their forms and, uh, you know, at totting up the points, are, are they failing to enforce the flood management part of, of that scheme? No, not at all. And, and you're quite right. Um, those features definitely exist. But the aggregate effect in many of the uplands is to keep sheep on the land when there would, no, would, would not otherwise be sheep on the land. And sheep on the land um, uh, seems to have a, a, a link to flooding downstream. So there are certain catchments, and I'm not looking at this as, as, in, as, as a generalised issue, but there are certain catchments where I feel it would be appropriate to have the rewooding of those lands. Rather than, you, uh, rather than what, what high-level stewardship delivers is a few little tiny pockets of trees and woodland, but basically maintaining the continued farm landscape. But you also said that soil comes off the land because of traditional farming practices associated with arable. So you're saying sheep on the uplands potentially leads to flooding, maize on the Somerset levels leads to flooding. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we know that which one causes which? Is it just from your observations? 
Well, or has there been any sort of scientific connection? I mean, apart from you going out walking. Well, we could look, for instance, at the Pont Bren study in Mid Wales, um, where um, the and again it was a, a, it's just on small scale, so we had to use computer models to um, look at what the bigger effects might be. But the scientists from Imperial College and the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology who studied that said that if um, the rewooding of, of, of the, the hills in the catchment took place across the catchment, you would likely reduce your flood peaks by 36%. And the reason for that was that they found that um, the infiltration rate on sheep pasture was extremely low. The infiltration rate under woodland was 67 times higher. Now, of course, that water will eventually come out of the soil, but again, it's a question of slowing it down. So there is data available, because at, at the beginning you were saying there isn't a lot of data and the hydrologists only tend to measure the flow of the river between concrete walls in cities, but obviously the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology are... Do you're saying they have done? Is it just this one small scale analysis, or are, are there any other analysis? You said there's a big data gap. Is that one little bit of data that we've got, and the rest is a big gap? That that's one of a, 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 a very few studies, and okay. we need we need a lot more. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Can I ask? Uh, as a, I think we're drawing to a close, but a, a final question. Then we've talked about a number of different measures. What further measures to, to manage the landscape and to manage the, the future increased risk of flooding Thank you. do you think the government or other authorities should be looking at? Well, there's been some success with woody dams in rivers, um, allowing woody debris to, to accumulate in, in, in parts of rivers. Belfort, uh, the, the Belford scheme, Loddington scheme, the Honeycott scheme and Exmoor, they all seem to have had some significant success in slowing down the flow of water. Um, now... All those need maintenance, but there is a way of doing it without maintenance, um, and which eventually costs nothing whatsoever and appears to be far more effective, which is the reintroduction of beavers. Um, and this might sound like an eccentric proposal to put before the committee, but um, I was recently looking at the Mid-Devon beaver trial, um, where just one pair of beavers had created 13 dams and were holding back, I believe, up 8,000 litres of water um, and um, had greatly changed the hydrology of the small stream on, on, on which they were working. Um, now, th of course, beavers can build their dams in the wrong places, which can cause floods, but it turns out that if you start them off by building a little sort of wicker dam, they will then build their next dam around that. Um, so you can actually direct them, and they beaver away extremely effectively, doing the work which we would otherwise have to do. So, um, and, and there's now um, some very interesting work coming out of the University of Exeter, Richard Brazier et al., um, showing that beavers can have a significant impact in um, attenuating flood flows downstream. And can beavers live successfully uh, across the country, or are there certain habitats where they wouldn't be able to be introduced? Um, they, they need a bit of woodland, um, and uh, they um, do all sorts of interesting things with that woodland, which tend to increase the hydraulic roughness of, of the floodplain. But as long as they've got woods, they can live anywhere in Britain, and they did. Um, there are plenty of place names um, uh, which still record their, their prior existence here. Go on. But can I ask the, the general strategy whether it's beavers or whether it's sort of human intervention is for greater upstream storage mm. through damming, be it through beavers or otherwise, uh, by implication with, with um, more global warming and all the rest of it, we'll have much larger amounts of storage over much bigger areas of land mm. above towns. Mm. Uh, and that's how we should plan ahead. Yep. Is that what you think? I would summarise it as slowing the flow. So that yeah. means not just storage, but it means slowing the flow off the hills in the first place um, and, and often um, reed beds, wood cover, um, um, all sorts of gully reforestation, for instance, can do that. All the things which, incidentally, are in effect banned as permanent ineligible features under the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, so you slow it, off, uh, slow it coming off the hills in the first place then slow down the rivers through allowing them to meander, to braid, to form islands. Um, trees growing on those islands also are extremely useful. They dump a lot of their load that way. Um, you slow down the flood peak. And then as the, the water comes down towards the floodplain, holding back as much of that water as possible on the fields. 
Um, it's all a question of staggering the release of water. So, if I, so a lot of this could be done irrespective of the EU, couldn't it? And then separate from that, you're proposing you know, we should make uh, representations, specific representations, of changing EU law yeah. to make it more flexible and in keeping with nature. It, it costs you a lot more to do it if you're having to fight the EU regulations at the same time, because farmers are having to forego money they would otherwise receive if they are to implement some of these natural flood management measures. Um, and, and so we are having to spend money twice, once on paying them to keep the land bare, and then on paying them to put back some of the features which they've just been told to remove. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mary, you wanted to come? I just had one very quick follow-up on the beavers. So um, what did the anglers make of the beavers? I mean, I don't yeah. know what beavers eat, because mm. I don't know much about them. So with the anglers crossed, I mean, presumably they ate a ton of fish. And the second thing is, if you are reintroducing a, a species and it's a male-female pair, what do you do to stop the, the offspring then mating with each other? Mm. So what happens next? Thank you. Well, the first thing, beavers are entirely herbivorous. Um, C.S. Lewis has got a lot to answer for because his beavers in Narnia eat fish, but um, in, uh, elsewhere, right. out of Narnia, um, <laughs> so on, this earth, on okay. this earth, they, they eat only vegetation. Um, and, and they create habitats for a mm. whole load of other species, including fish. Now, um, I've been having a few rows with the Angling Trust about this because, um, in my view, quite perversely, um, they, they seem to be against beavers, whereas in many other parts of the world, anglers love beavers because they create the pools where trout get a lot bigger, um, where the salmon breed, they create the riffle sections which um, where the gravel lies, where the reds are that, that the, the fish make their nests in. Um, there's, there's a whole, whole series of, of ways in which beavers actually improve the fishing. Um, and so that argument I think will continue for a while. Now you, you raise an important and pertinent question there has to be a minimum population size if that size is going yes. to be viable. Um, and, and, that, and, and in fact, there is a programme down in Devon being run by Derek Gow to try to bring in as much genetic diversity into Britain's beavers as possible to, to make sure that they'll be able to survive here in the long run as okay, a result. Thank you. Devon is, as always, leading the way. <laughs> <laughs> as I always, I always like to, to point out. <laughs> of course. Uh, Mr Monbiot, thank you very much indeed. Thank We're very you. grateful for your time. Apologies again that we were late starting, I'm afraid, but we found it extremely interesting. So thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. Thank you.